I've changed a few things up since uh, Lawton uh, printed uh, this uh, past uh, week. And so I want to take a look at the entirety of uh, chapter uh, 59 this morning. Uh, that's uh, page 619 in the Pew Bibles, or 777, a good number uh, in the large print uh, Bibles. Isaiah 59, beginning in verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. For your hands are defiled with, with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. No one enters a suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas and they speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adder's eggs. They weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies. And from one that is crushed, a viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know, and there is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold, darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan. And moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and we know our iniquities. Transgressing and denying the Lord, and turning back from following our God, speaking oppression and revolt conceiving and uttering from the heart lying words. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adver adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion. To those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. This is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired work. May he write 
its eternal truths on each of our hearts this morning. Must admit, uh, and even with uh, some of the changes to uh, our sermon text this morning, uh, it's not easy just to jump into uh, the book of Isaiah, at least not for me. And I think to, to, to better understand Isaiah 59, especially as, as it is a, a good practice with any uh, chapter of the Bible, it's helpful to go back a chapter uh, and to also then read uh, the following chapter. Uh, it helps us get the context of it. If you uh, were to look, or if you're looking now at uh, chapter 58, there's uh, this question that arises in chapter 58 uh, about God listening to the, the Israelites' prayers. Uh, and this feeds into then chapter 59. And it revolves around just this very simple question of uh, why is God apparently not listening? Why does God not hear or understand our prayers and our requests? Uh, they even go on and talk at length about their fasting. They say, we're fasting too, Lord. Uh, how come you don't understand and the answer that comes back to them uh, is really twofold. The people are praying and fasting. God does not seem to be listening. Uh, as far as their fasting goes, the issue is, I think, very much the same as it is today uh, with some of uh, our practices around Lent, for instance. The problem is not that you are denying yourself things. The problem is that you are not denying yourself, is what God is saying to us both today and in the past. And the reason that God does not seem to be listening, the reason he appears at least to be distant, is not because of any problem with God. It's a problem that we have, that we need to take account of. And I think this is especially helpful as we contemplate uh, Advent and uh, Christ's incarnation, Christ taking on human flesh. If you recall, leading up to uh, the, the time that Jesus came, there was another time where God seemed to be very silent, very distant. Scholars will refer to this as the intertestamental period uh, from the time of uh, the end of Malachi's uh, ministry approximately 400 BC to the time that John the Baptist comes as the last of the prophets. About 400 years of silence from God and, and the people of God have been waiting these 400 years asking themselves, wondering why God has been so silent just as they're doing in Isaiah's day. And so we want to approach uh, Isaiah 59 with uh, what I think is a very natural uh, break in this uh, chapter. It, it should become very apparent to you as you look at the pronouns. Uh, the pronouns in verses 1, uh, 2, and 3 are you and your pronouns. Verses 4 through 8, you'll notice that they change to they, them, and their pronouns. Verses 9 through 15, then, uh, use us and our. And then verses 16 through 21, he, him, and his are all used. So, first of all, the you and your pronouns we see in verses 1, 2, and 3. Three, you'll notice verse 1 really uh, is a response to uh, chapter 58. It's not God's problem. His arm is not shortened. It, it, it's not that, that he has hearing problems. <laughs> the problem is sin, is what Isaiah is saying here. Verse 2, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear you. The problem is always sin. And the problem with sin is that it always divides. Those of you, uh, uh, and, and we can even go a step further and say that, that what Isaiah has in focus here 
is that, that the people of God have not repented of their sin. What we're dealing with here is unrepentant sin. Now those of you uh, that are married here this morning probably know this quite well, that, that sin separates. The last time you had a lover's tiff for a quarrel or whatever you want to call it, how does it play out, right? There's separation. There's silence oftentimes, right? There's not talking. There's awkwardness at the dinner table. This doesn't just apply to uh, married relationships. Children know this quite well. You uh, have uh, an incident with a friend or a brother or a sister, and what happens? There's distance. There's awkwardness. There's separation between the two of you, and it tends to widen more and more the longer time goes on, and nothing is done. Repentance is not sought after. Leaders in the church know this all too well in uh, discipling and ministering God's people. There's a uh, story I heard many years ago that was, uh, at least when I heard it, attributed to Thomas Chalmers. Uh, looking it up again, uh, it's one of those stories that has been passed around. I, I found it attributed to Dwight L. Moody, uh, to Charles Spurgeon, to really about a half dozen other uh, saints now in glory. So I'm just going to attribute it this morning to Thomas Chalmers, where uh, Chalmers apparently goes to... Uh, a man's house that's uh, a member of the congregation. He has not been coming to church because of some uh, uh, fallout that he's had with somebody in the church. And as he's seeking to minister to this man, uh, it's in Scotland and, and they often have coal fires. It's one of the lovely things about uh, uh, life over there. And as the story goes, Chalmers reaches into the fire and he, with uh, tongs, pulls out a coal and sets it on the hearth as they talk. And what happens, of course, is that the rest of the uh, coals remain glowing red and hot. And what happens uh, to the one that he placed on the hearth, uh, it eventually gets cooler and cooler until it turns black again and goes out. And Chalmers then uses this as uh, his analogy to this man and says, look, this is what happens when you are unrepentant. This is what happens when you harbor uh, grief or anger or even perceived sin against others in the congregation. This is what happens when you separate yourself willingly from the body of believers. Separation always happens when it comes to sin. Whether it's our interpersonal relationships within the church, whether it's our marriages, whether it's our interactions with our children or co-workers, you name it. Sin always divides and it always conquers. Look at the list in verse 3 that Isaiah uh, pulls out here. He says, your hands are defiled with blood, murder, bloodshed, shocking sins, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies, your tongue mutters wickedness. There's a connection here. It starts in the hands but moves down and permeates into the fingers. It, it starts in uh, the lips and proceeds on then on into the tongue and out the mouth. How subtly at first sin uh, enters into, and into our lives. But it's not long, especially if it's unrepented sin, before it spreads, it pervades, penetrates, and perverts everything that it touches, causing division between uh, man and man, uh, and especially between God and man. Notice the warnings again in verse 2. Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins 
have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. There's perhaps some here this morning wondering the same as they were wondering in Isaiah's day, the same as they were wondering during the intertestamental period. Why is it that God seems so distant, so silent from me? Well, the question for you then is, well, are there sins in your life that you have not repented of? That you need to go before God first and foremost and confess. And then go to your fellow man and ask repentance of. Isaiah then moves uh, to verses 4 through 8. It goes from you and your as personal sins to then uh, uh, we see this spreading even more out into society then. God's people, corporately speaking here, in verse 4, sin uh, passes from individuals, it permeates, uh, perverts, and penetrates our lives, and then it spreads into society. Verse 4, no one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. They rely on empty pleas, they speak lies, they conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. It spreads now from individuals to the society. In verse 4, he has the justice system in view. I was surprised to see a little bit uh, that NBC News has estimated that $80 billion dollars or approximately 10% of the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP, was pilfered during the pandemic. 80 billion with a B. So if that wasn't bad enough, that's on top of the estimated 90 billion to 400 billion. It's a wide gap. Uh, at, at the very least, 90 billion at most. It's estimated 400 billion dollars on top of the 80 from the PPP is believed to have been stolen from the $900 billion COVID unemployment relief program. You guys remember COVID, don't you? And another than 80 billion potentially pilfered from a separate COVID disaster relief program. It's the greatest fraud in the history of our country, if this is true. And I, 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 I don't see why you would question these, these numbers, but maybe you can, maybe you will, that's fine. But here's the thing, I mean, how, how much does that bother us as a people, as a society? Sadly, I'm going to go on record as saying not as much as it should. Greatest fraud in American History has just taken place before our very eyes. No one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. Notice the root causes here, verse 5. They hatch adders, eggs. They weave the spider's web. Talk to a zoologist, they'll tell you that uh, an adder is a genus of the viper uh, family of snakes, which uh, gives birth to live young, not uh, laying eggs. That's not a problem with uh, the biblical text. It's a problem probably with our translation here. The word adder is probably uh, not 100% accurate here. There's probably another snake uh, being referred to uh, in uh, verse 5. I say that not to make you doubt the text, but rather to just simply uh, point it out and realize uh, that it's really not that big of a deal. The point is that here, corruption breeds corruption, is what Isaiah is saying. You eat the eggs, you die, you crush the eggs. They uh, uh, live and breed more uh, Young, more vipers, more snakes. 
on and on the corruption goes. Corruption breeds corruption until it becomes really a second nature to people in countries and in societies. Remember in 2005, a seminary professor of mine uh, had been uh, going over to the Ukraine, it would have been about 2005, to uh, teach a week-long class on the Pauline epistles. And as they were traveling around the city, he and his translator, uh, he, I remember sharing that they had gone down into the subway. And uh, he had money on him for his subway fare and the translators, but he said the subway, uh, the, uh, the translator went on ahead of him and just jumped the gate. And the, this professor was sort of taken aback. And he said, oh, I apologize, the translator did. He said, you know, he said, I've got money for you to ride in some way, just don't, you know, it's just second nature to him. It's just what you do, you just jump the gate and, and on you go. It's a vicious cycle that, that permeates throughout societies and things get worse and worse. Smash one egg and another one grows up breeds more eggs, and on and on it goes. Notice in verse 6, also, the promise that is held out for these societies, sort of the fuel that drives them, their webs will not serve as clothing. He's talking about spiders now. Two of my least favorite Creatures on God's green earth are snakes and spiders. It's, it's no accident. Isaiah attributes them uh, to sin, I don't think. Uh, their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what they make. Their works are works of iniquity, and deeds of violence are in their hands. Sin never delivers what it promises to deliver. It's always brokenness, always separation, always death and iniquity and violence and destruction. Isaiah moves on in verses 9 through 15. He starts to own some of these societal sins. Notice the us and their pronouns now, starting in verse 9. Therefore, justice is far from us, and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light, and behold darkness, and for brightness, but we walk in gloom again. Sin never delivers. You have to love uh, Isaiah's preaching style here. His use of similes are, are really unparalleled. Notice verse 10, we grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon, as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. Verse 11, we all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. Heard bears growl, thankfully, only uh, in zoos. I've heard uh, uh, doves uh, much more often. Uh, they're uh, moaning. This is what it's like, he's saying. This is what we uh, must do. The pronouns change to become more personal. And what Isaiah is, is essentially saying through his use of language here is that we need to own our sin again. He's driving us back to the fact that we need to confess, we need to repent. And you can't repent of something if you think you haven't done anything wrong, if you think you haven't contributed, if you think you haven't played a part in it. That we have all sinned and fallen short. We all need to be constantly repenting of our sin. person who I uh, greatly admire in society, he died 
early 2000s. There's a man by the name you've probably heard of, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And uh, Solzhenitsyn was uh, condemned uh, to the gulags in uh, communist Russia for many years. He suffered and struggled there. He was released, uh, sought asylum in the United States in the mid-70s, was granted uh, a reprieve there. And in 1978, uh, Harvard University invited Solzhenitsyn to deliver their commencement address. It was not a very long address. You can still find it on uh, the internet today. But what happened during this uh, commencement address is, is really quite interesting. Uh, here, the uh, intelligentsia uh, of the day, the American uh, thinkers, typified by Harvard education, the pinnacle of our uh, education, higher education system, thought that Solzhenitsyn was going to come in, that he was going to uh, tear down communism for all its wiles and struggles and problems, and to uphold capitalism as its great uh, refu refutal. And that's not at all what he did. And you can, you can actually listen to it online as well if you know where to look and find it. Um, almost caused a riot at this Harvard commencement address because what Solzhenitsyn did was not to compare and contrast capitalism and communism. What he did is he threw them both on the same side of the spectrum and said, without God, you are doomed to failure. That you need a totally different view of the world. You need a, a theistic view. You need God in your life. And the place lost its mind. They, they, they couldn't handle it. Look at what verse 15 says here for just a moment. Truth is lacking. Again, he's talking about societies here. And he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Guess what happened to Solzhenitsyn after this? He was one of the first to be canceled. We talk about cancel culture today. No more speaking engagements, at least not big ones like this. The man blew it in most intellectuals' minds. Truth is lacking. But he told the truth. And he made himself a prey as those in Isaiah's day were doing. And I wish I could tell you it was different for us today, but it's not. Christians speak the truth today and see what happens. Stand up for the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way to salvation and see how you are treated. It probably will not go well for you, just to warn you. But I say that not to dissuade you from doing that. I say that to encourage you all the more. And that's where we come to this final set of pronouns, verses 16 through 21. He changes again, and now Isaiah is using masculine and singular pronoun. Verse 16, he saw that there was no man, that is God, and wondered that there was no one to intercede, that his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. That's what Advent is. There was no one that could deliver, no one that could go forth. God on behalf of man. God had to work salvation by his own powerful arm, bring salvation unto his people through the birth of his only son, Jesus Christ. Notice the last clause there of verse 16, and his righteousness upheld him. And then we get into a little more clothing language here, just very briefly, verse 17. 
hopefully conjures up images for you uh, of another section in uh, the Bible. The man is dressed here in the armor of God. It should draw our attention to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where Paul talks about the armor of God. You know, there's uh, a school of thought there that says, well, you know, uh, Paul was probably chained to a Roman soldier while writing uh, about this. And therefore, uh, he sees the, the soldier's armor. He's thinking about that, but I, I don't think that's quite where I would go with that. I think what Paul is doing very clearly here is thinking about Isaiah 59. The man dressed in the armor of God. He's thinking of the man of God himself and the armor and the clothing that he possesses, that he puts on, that he then gives to us to equip ourselves. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit of God, all of these things Christ himself bore and bears as he came into this world. But don't ever forget here the righteousness that he has clothed himself with. And I think there's a direct uh, correlation here between the righteousness of Jesus Christ in uh, verses 17 through 20 and verse 6 where he talks about our own feet being like clothing ourselves in spiders' webs. The comparison, uh, it's not even really a comparison, is it? The righteousness of Christ for these cobwebs that we have tried to clothe ourselves in, in our own righteousness. We can't do it. You can't keep God's law Perfectly, You can't do it like Christ has done it, so stop trying. Look to what Jesus has done, that he has fulfilled God's law perfectly. This is why he is born of a woman, like we read about this morning. This is why he takes on human flesh, so that he can live his life on this earth in perfect obedience to God's law, so that he might attain this righteousness so that he might give this righteousness to you and to me and to all that believe and put their faith in Jesus Christ means to be clothed in his righteousness and not your own. And then finally, what do we do once we are wrapped in this righteousness of God? Look down at verse 19. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. We are to fear the Lord. What does that mean? It means quite simply to, to look on him, to look at what he has done, to stand in awe, to stand in wonder, reverence of what he has done. To fear God is to trust in Him, to look for His favor more than we do the favor of man, family, or anyone else. And then finally, verse 21. And as for me, this is my covenant. This is God's promise to you and to me, to our children, that, that, that God has bound Himself to this. God has placed his name, his entire reputation on this promise that he will redeem you from your sins through the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ, and only through that. What are you living for this morning? What are you trusting in? What are you putting your faith in as you go from here? Your goodness, your righteousness, 
your possessions, perhaps. All of these, the scripture says, are nothing more than a spider's webs. They fall apart, they don't last. They amount to absolutely nothing. And we wonder why God seems so distant sometimes. Wonder why he doesn't seem to answer our prayers. Could it be that you're trusting this morning more in your own goodness, your own mercy, your own righteousness, than you are that of Jesus Christ? And so brothers and sisters, be humbled by that, but be encouraged as well. That because of this promise that God has made, because he has promised it, it will come true. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put into your mouth. That we look to what Jesus has done to forgive us of our sins. And it's there that we are strengthened, there that we are empowered. There that we are enabled to repent of our sins, both to God and to those that we have sinned against. All of this has been promised to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Put your faith in him. Submit to him still. And know the joys that he has for you this Advent season. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, continue to guide and direct our steps. Build us up in our faith. Enable us to admit when we are wrong and own our sin, to confess it to you and to those that we have sinned against. Thank you for the mercy that you have showed to us through Jesus Christ. Continue to bless us through him, we pray. Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing.